Well, Mark mentioned that uh, we're starting a new series, and you probably saw that in the bulletin, and I think I may have mentioned it last week. We're beginning a series in 1 Timothy. Uh, we will actually... First and Second Timothy, because I plan on going on to the second book after we finish the first. But we're going to begin First Timothy with the first two verses, which is the introduction to the book. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus, who is our hope. To Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, and Christ Jesus our Lord. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of study in it together. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. When Augustine, the Bishop of Hippo, was on his deathbed, the barbarians were at the gate. The vandals had swept across North Africa, demolishing churches and killing Christians. In the last months of his life, Augustine watched his life's work be destroyed. Not long after his death, his city fell. It was a singular event of history. And yet, I think it illustrates the church in every age. The barbarians are always at the gate, whether they are the forces of secularism or Christian heresy, the gospel is always under attack. It is in our day, really, as much as it was in Augustine's day in the 5th century, and it was in Paul's day. What occupied the last months of Augustine's life was truth. The vandals were outside the city, but Augustine spent hours in his library writing books, and answering attacks from rebellious monks and venomous heretics, particularly the Pelagians, he defended the gospel. And that was true of the Apostle Paul. The last letters he wrote are the pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy and Titus. They are all concerned about the future and preserving the truth. Throughout these letters, Paul speaks of the truth the faith, sound doctrine, teaching. He was concerned about preserving the church, the, the truth of the Christian faith. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, he calls the church the pillar and support of the truth. When the church fails, truth disappears. That is Satan's goal to shake the pillar, to weaken the church. So throughout these letters, Paul gives us direction on strengthening the local church. That was the purpose of the book. He said so in 1 Timothy 3, verse 15, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. So he gives instruction on prayer, on the roles of men and women in worship, the relationship between the church and state, the qualifications for leadership in the church. There is a right way for the church to function so that it maintains its integrity and it does what it is supposed to do, which is guard the truth. Now that has to do with correct organization, with leadership, plurality of leadership, such as plurality of elders. But an organization is only as strong as its people. So Paul also instructs on holiness, godliness, and warns of the dangers of various things, such as riches. This book is filled with positive instructions and dire warnings. Are we any less needy of that? Has anything really changed in 2,000 years? Well, you say, oh, many things have changed in 2,000 years. Our understanding of the world has expanded with the age of exploration, 
The age of science has brought amazing developments and changes in technology and the comforts and conveniences that we have today. And all of that's true, but basically, has anything really changed? Human nature is the same. And we are all, as we have already sung this morning, prone to wander and neglect the Scriptures for other things. It's always been that way. The Lord told Jeremiah, ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. Why does the Lord say that to the prophet? Because people always want to get off the ancient paths. God's people want to do that. They're fascinated with with new things, new ideas that draw them away from the old and unchanging truth of God. These are bypaths, distractions. Paul calls them myths and worldly fables, and he tells of people wanting to have their ears tickled. These are a diversion from the truth. Paul repeatedly warns against that. People are also naturally enamored of the law and doing and earning things, putting themselves in a a yoke. That's how Peter described it and said, a yoke that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. And yet, God's people are drawn to that. These are Satan's wiles. These are his stratagems for for pulling down the pillars of the truth. He's always at the gate. He is always at work outside of the church and within the church, always subverting the truth. Paul saw that happening. He was an old man when he wrote the pastoral letters. He, He knew his time in this world was short. And he was concerned for the future of the church. He was concerned for the gospel, for the message of the church. His specific concern was for the church in Ephesus. There were men there who were introducing all kinds of strange teaching. He calls, the, he calls these men men who wanted to be teachers of the law. Paul was not there. He couldn't deal with this directly, but Timothy was. And so in verse 3, he tells Timothy, Remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines. Well, that's how it is done. That's how we defend the faith and guard the truth and protect the church from error. We have to expose error with truth and actually confront purveyors of error face to face. Now that's not easy to do. It requires that a person know the scriptures and that he, that we, have faith and walk by faith. Trust the Lord like David did when he walked out into the valley to fight Goliath. So before Paul gives Timothy this assignment, he first gives him the encouragement to do it, and the authority on which to act. That is the first two verses of the book. It's the introduction to this book. Just two verses, but they tell us a lot about Paul and a lot about Timothy and why Paul had confidence in him to accomplish the hard assignment that he gave to him. Timothy is a man that most of us can identify with. John Stott wrote, we feel that he is one of us in all our frailty. And in both of the pastoral epistles with his name, we learn a lot about those weaknesses. He was young. We know that from what Paul said to him. Let no one look down on your youthfulness and flee from youthful lusts. Uh, Assuming that Timothy was a teenager when he joined Paul on his second missionary journey, he was most likely in his mid-30s when this letter was written. 
young people can be fearless of danger and eager to be soldiers due to naivety or personality. I, I know that this used to be the case. I'm not so sure it is anymore, but recruiters would, uh, for the Army, would like to have young men of the age of 18 to sign up and become soldiers because at the age of 18, they have a sense of uh, immortality, they, of an in, invincibility, and they take on challenges that most people might uh, hesitate from. But Timothy was not like that at all. He was not that kind of young man. He was a shy person. He was a reluctant warrior. That was his personality. But also, he wasn't 18 by this time. He had experience. He, he knew how cruel the world was. He knew how difficult even Christians could be. He, he, he naturally shied away from conflict. At the end of 1 Corinthians, Paul told that church that Timothy might be coming to them, and he cautions them by saying, see that he is with you without cause to be afraid. In other words, behave yourselves. The Corinthians were a tough bunch, so Paul was saying, don't make life difficult for him. He's young and shy. In fact, he has been called timid Timothy. Well, that's a hard thing to have to deal with anyway, but especially when dealing with people who are on the wrong path, especially when correcting misguided people, particularly some people who may be very confident in the error they are purveyors of and may have some strength of personality, some charisma, some influence. It's difficult to deal with such people. It's an intimidating task to confront that. Add to that that he was sickly. He was suffering from a chronic gastric condition, a problem with his stomach. In chapter 5, Paul prescribes a little wine for his stomach and frequent ailments. Timothy was young, shy, and sickly. That is not the profile of a spiritual warrior, a valiant for truth. Who doesn't sympathize with Timothy and feel for him as Paul seems to be shoving him out into the arena to fight lions? But no one sympathized with Timothy more than Paul. He too suffered afflictions and weakness. He suffered a thorn in the flesh. He experienced the attacks of people and rejection. But he knew Timothy better than anyone knew him. He had nurtured him in the faith as they served together. So Paul had great confidence in him. He knew this young man. He knew that Timothy was reliable. In fact, he told the Philippians that he had no one else of kindred spirit like Timothy, what a word of commendation that is. I don't have anyone else quite like Timothy of kindred spirit. And he reminded them of his proven worth in serving Paul in the gospel. He was like a child serving his father, he said. And that's how he speaks of Timothy here in verse 2. He calls him, my true child in the faith. Paul loved Timothy. His Jewish mother and grandmother had taught him the Bible from an early age, but Paul seems to have led him to the Lord when he and Barnabas came to Lystra on uh, the first missionary journey. When he returned on the second missionary journey, Timothy had grown spiritually so much that Paul brought him with him to Europe, preaching the gospel along with Paul, and Paul taught Timothy the faith, and he taught him the Christian life. He taught him much. So he calls Timothy my true child in the faith. Timothy's natural father was a Greek and a pagan, like Augustine's father. So it was Paul who trained him up spiritually and morally. He loved him like a son. He knew his weaknesses, 
and was sensitive to him. Paul wasn't throwing Timothy into the deep end and telling him to sink or swim. Paul was aware of the, the issues that Timothy had, but Paul also knew Timothy's strengths, his spiritual gifts and God's calling of him. And Paul knew, most importantly, the Lord's sufficiency. He experienced it daily. And that's the real issue. Timothy was not some shy, sickly young man out on his own. None of us is. God never throws us back on ourselves to rely on our own resources. He supplies grace. That is how we live every moment of our lives. He supplies grace. In his book, Devoted to God, Sinclair Ferguson points out that Paul coined a new expression, one that has no parallel in Greek literature. He spoke of believing in Christ with the preposition into. It's not translated into, but but that's the force of it, into, movement into, so that faith in God's Son is literally believing into Jesus Christ. Through faith alone, we enter into Christ personally. And forever, the believer is in Christ. That's a different preposition that he uses for in. It speaks of location. We are located in Christ permanently permanently once we've entered into Him. In fact, that is Paul's favorite expression of the Christian. He or she is a person in Christ, located in Christ. And that's how the Lord described our relationship to Him in the upper room. Probably where Paul got this understanding and the reason he used so frequently this expression, in Christ. Because in John 15, the Lord spoke of our relationship to Him and with the analogy of the vine and the branches. We are like a branch In the vine, take a branch out of the vine, there's no life, there's no fruit, it must be in the vine to be productive. And so as a branch has life and bears fruit by being in the vine, so we have our spiritual life, our obedience and deeds of righteousness, our life of faith from Christ. It's all a gift. It's His work. We are in Christ And Christ is in us. That explains everything about our lives. Paul spoke of that in Colossians 1, verse 27. You may remember from a few months back, he spoke of the mystery. Christ in you, the hope of glory. He lives in us through the Holy Spirit. We really have Him and we have His life in us. It's a reality. That is life-changing, life-enabling power. We need to know that. We need to believe it. We need to live according to it. We impoverish ourselves when we don't understand that and we don't act upon it. Dr. Ferguson also wrote, our forefathers used to speak of living below the level of our privileges. And that's what we do when we don't understand who we are in Christ, what we have in Christ. We live below the level of our privileges. Paul knew this of himself and Timothy, that they were not on their own in the great work of building the church and guarding its message, the gospel of salvation. We're not on our own in this task. We have enabling power and we have great privileges as children of God, as sons and daughters of God. He speaks all about God's initiative, Paul does, and his work for him, for Paul personally, and for Timothy in these two verses. They're all about God's sovereign grace. God. Paul's great theme throughout his writings. First, he speaks of his calling to be an apostle in verse 1. That's how the letter begins. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God our Savior. Paul wasn't an apostle due to his own calling, 
his own initiative. He didn't appoint himself to the office. He didn't say that would be a nice thing to be, an apostle. I like the opportunities and the authority. I think I'm going to aspire to that and become one of those. Not at all. He was commanded by God to be an apostle. Normally, Paul wrote that he was an apostle by the will of God. Now, that's a strong enough statement in and of itself. But here he speaks more forcefully of being commanded by God as being sent out by the king of the universe with all of his authority. He's under divine command to function in that office. Now, that's grace. Paul didn't choose to be an apostle. God chose him. God took the initiative, not Paul. And he did so at the most unusual time that underscores the sovereign grace of it all. He did so when Paul was on the Damascus Road as Saul of Tarsus on the war path to kill Christians. That's when he stopped him and turned him around. Later in verse 15, Paul calls himself the foremost of sinners. That's the one that God commanded to be his apostle to the Gentiles, the foremost of sinners. The great apostle of grace was the object of the greatest grace. Now Paul stated all of this to remind Timothy and the church of his authority. Often you see this, and you see it especially in the book of Galatians, but you see hints of it throughout Paul's letters. Men called into question his apostleship. Well, you're not one of the twelve. You're not one of the original. You came later. He's a second-tier kind of apostle. And so Paul has to argue, no, no, I am equal with the apostles. I am a genuine apostle. And here he's saying, it's not only by the will of God, it's by the command of God that he is. And so he is... He is reminding Timothy, he's reminding of the church of that. He was indicating in this that he's on the level, same level with the 12 apostles. He's not inferior to them. And in stating that, he was reminding Timothy that he too, that Timothy was ministering in that authority, in that apostolic authority, in the absence of Paul, because the Apostle Paul had instructed him to remain at Ephesus and to teach and correct. He was also reminding the church of Ephesus of this. Uh, the letter was not a private communication between uh, Paul and Timothy. We might think it is, but then you come to the end of it. And the last uh, statement that the, the Apostle makes in, in chapter uh, 6 and verse 21 is, grace be with you. And the you is plural. He's greeting the entire church. So this letter would have been read, read to the entire church. And they would have known about the authority given to Timothy. But if anyone questioned Timothy's authority, all he needed to do was show them this first verse of the letter. He was acting in the authority of an apostle. And if he himself had some self-doubt about that, all he needed to do was pick up this letter and reread it and look at this instruction at the very beginning. And it's good for us to remember that as we study through this letter, the things that may surprise us, and there are some su surprising things, things that, that um, seem out of step with contemporary culture, remember this is the writing of an apostle, a representative of Jesus Christ. This is a letter that has authority. And so we are to approach this book as God's revelation to us. That is the reason Paul begins the way that he does with a statement of his apostleship. It is the seal of His authority. And it is therefore our authority as we teach it, as we listen to it. This is the authority upon which anyone teaches this book. It is the Word of God. Still, in reminding Timothy and the church of his authority, he cannot help 
but give glory to God for the grace and favor that the Lord had showed to him. And that is made all the clearer by the way Paul describes God. He was an apostle by the commandment of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus who is our hope. Now, that is an important Christological statement. And what I mean by that is it tells us a lot about Jesus Christ. It shows His deity by indicating His equality with God the Father. Both commanded Paul to be an apostle. The Son as much as the Father. They are on the same level. They are equal in power and glory, in in essence and substance. Christ is God. Christ is God the Son. Now that's a lot of theology in just the first verse of the book. But there's more. And again, it's all about grace. And that's indicated in the titles Paul uses for these two of the three persons of the Godhead. God the Father is described as our Savior. We normally think of Christ as our Savior. But here, the Father is the Savior. It's an Old Testament expression. Mary used it in her Magnificat in Luke chapter 1, verse 47. My spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. So even the Virgin Mary needed a Savior, as all men do. The Father is the Savior because, as revealed in John 3, 16, He sent His only begotten Son into the world. He set His love upon a vast number of people, His elect, and He sent His Son to redeem them. In fact, He prepared a body for His Son. That's what the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews 10, 5. And all of that so that He would die as a substitute for sinners for a world of sinners. Now that looks back in time. It looks back in history to the Father's work of salvation, the description of Christ as our hope looks forward in time to the culmination of salvation when He returns for His people. It's a reminder that salvation is of the Lord, altogether of the Lord. It's not our work, it's His work. And He promises to fulfill it. He began the work and He will complete the work. That's the assurance we have. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. What Christ did at the cross, redeem believers from the penalty of sin, He will complete at His glorious return when He saves us from the very presence of sin. That is our hope. So in all of this, Paul is not only giving Timothy the authority to minister, he was also giving him the encouragement to minister. Remaining on in Ephesus would not be easy. It would be a challenge. But we minister with hope, with certain hope. The future is certain. The promises of God are certain. And the end of it all is going to be glorious. The Lord is coming and His reward is with Him. That's what He says at the end of the book of Revelation. That's our hope. So Paul was urging Timothy, in effect, be brave, be steadfast, work hard. But Timothy, and we have more than gratitude for Christ's sacrifice and more than hope of His return to give us incentive to serve, we have sustaining grace. We have empowering grace now in the present at work at us in this very moment. That's what Paul prays for at the end of verse 2. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. That's a triple blessing that he prays. It's a triple blessing he wanted for young Timothy. And again, these three virtues come equally from God and Christ. Again, supporting the reality, the truth, that Jesus Christ is is the second person of the Godhead, equal with the first person and third person of the Godhead. It's all from the Father and the Son. They work in concert. 
Paul typically introduced his letters with the formula grace and peace, but here he adds mercy to that. All three were appropriate for the occasion and particularly necessary for Timothy. Grace here looks beyond saving grace and refers to what we might call continuing grace or grace for living. We are never not in need of grace. This is the unconditional love of God that provides for all of our needs and well beyond anything that we can imagine that we need. In fact, that's how Paul, in one of his prayers, in his prayer in Ephesians 3, verse 20, how he speaks of, of God's blessings to us. He says that he is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. We pray for things. We think we understand what we need. We don't get what we want because God has something better for us. Or we pray for a, a particular need to be dealt with, and He deals with it in a way far greater than anything we could have imagined. He does far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. That's grace. And He does it in spite of ourselves. It's all a gift. An undeserved gift, often an unexpected gift. But Paul adds to that mercy, which is equally undeserved, but it's been explained as help for the helpless. These terms are defined differently by different people, but this is the term, the definition I like of mercy, help for the helpless. And that was just what Timothy needed. Timothy at times would feel he was in over his head, as any wise person would, but situations would sometimes bring him, as Kent Hughes said, to the end of himself. And we see that in these letters that Paul writes to him. But God would always be there. Jesus promised to never to leave or forsake us. And it's in the, these challenges of life, the challenges of the ministry, the, the challenges to our faith that... Um, that we really experience that, experience the Lord's presence and come to know it. And really, it doesn't matter whether you are a Timothy or a Paul. We're all just dust. Paul asked himself, or asked actually the congregation he wrote to in 2 Corinthians 2 verse 16, who is adequate for these things? He asked that of those people. He asked that of himself, no doubt. And, then, and that's a question that uh, res deserves the response, yes, who indeed is adequate for these things? And then he answers the question later in chapter 3, verse 5, our adequacy is from God. That's humility. And that is necessary if we are going to look to the Lord. He is the source of power and ability. Someone said, I think it was Oswald Chambers, that all through history God has chosen and used nobodies because their unusual dependence on Him made possible the unique display of His power and grace. And that's true. Now He has used great men in His service. The Apostle Paul was a great man intellectually and in many ways. Uh, Augustine, whom I've mentioned was a great man, a genius. The world recognizes that about Augustine. You can go down through history and see great men and women that God has used, but He has used them only to the degree that they humbly look to Him for grace and mercy. We do, if we look to ourselves as great, we will not be used of the Lord. In fact, to, to teach that Fact to the Apostle Paul, the Lord gave him a severe lesson. That thorn in the flesh. It was terribly debilitating. In fact, Paul prayed three times that it would be removed. And you can just understand his thinking. This is crippling me. Lord, it's not helping the ministry. Remove it. And the answer he got was no. It is for your good. And that's how Paul explained it. He said, it was to keep me from exalting myself. 
God told him, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Paul, this is what you need in order to rely completely upon me. We don't, we don't invite those kind of things on ourselves. We don't wish that. God will supply it. We don't need to seek it. But it had a good purpose. And it was for that, to humble him and cause him to look wholly and completely to the Lord. His thorn and weakness really were his strength. And maybe Timothy's shyness was his thorn. It was a hard burden to bear. But it was his strength if it cast him back on the Lord himself for grace and mercy. But Paul also prayed that Timothy would have peace. Personal peace, the peace of God, which is the result of, first of all, having peace with God. Peace of justification and salvation. Timothy had that, so Paul prayed that he would enjoy that and have the inner peace of tranquility that allows one to rise above the turmoil of the circumstance, to rest in the Lord and be calm in the storms. And he would have that in the conflicts he faced, knowing that he was acting in the authority of God and Christ, knowing that he was obeying God's word and defending the truth. That few things will give a person more confidence and more certainty in his or her life and carrying out a ministry and standing for the truth and knowing that he or she does stand for the truth, possesses the truth. And that's what Timothy had and Paul had. And as he would walk by faith, God would bless him with this triple blessing. That's the Christian life, walking by faith, knowing God's will, and walking in that path, walking in the ancient paths. And really, the task given to Timothy is the task given to all of us. This isn't just a historical issue and a particular assignment. This is, what, this is for all of us. This is what we've all been given the task to do, to defend the faith, to defend the truth, to promote the truth, we are the church, the pillar and support of the church. And we are to know the truth and we are to guard the truth. We may be called to do that on a large stage or on a small stage. If you're a, a mother and a father, you're to do that within the home. And you may think, well, that's a very small stage. Well, I suppose it is in some sense, but it's the fundamental stage. It's where it begins Christian home should be a place of light where the truth is known and where it's lived. The book of 1 Timothy instructs us on how to do that, how to conduct ourselves in the household of God, what the truth is that we must believe and follow and defend. This book is for us today. John Calvin dedicated his commentaries on 1 and 2 Timothy to the Duke of Somerset, who was the instructor and guardian of the King of England, Edward VI. Calvin wrote, Everything in these letters is highly relevant to our own times. It is highly relevant to our times as well. Well, how is that? How is it that a book that is 2,000 years old, written in a different language, in a different time, to a world long gone, how is it that it can be highly relevant to our times, relevant to today? Well, the reason is it's God's eternal word. It's the ancient path that we're to stay on. And it's under attack. Barbarians are at the gate as much today as in Paul's day and Augustine's day. But as we follow this word, God will prosper this church and confirm the works of our hands. Yes, confirm the works of our hands. He established the works of Augustine's hands. Shortly after his death, the vandals broke down the gates of the city and sacked it. But amazingly... They left his library unharmed. 
His writings survived. Centuries later, those writings became one of the catalysts for the Reformation and the worldwide spread of the gospel. So his ministry wasn't destroyed. God's work won't be destroyed. Hell's gate cannot ultimately prevail against the church. Not ultimately. And he uses us. He uses nobodies. He uses Timothys to defend the truth. Well, may he give us the grace to do that. And may we seek the grace to do that. If you don't know the truth, if you don't know the gospel of salvation in Christ alone, our prayer for you is that you hear it, that you understand it, that it penetrate into your heart, that the light of the truth of God's word radiate within you and that you believe it and believe in him who is the Savior. What is the gospel? Well, Paul gives the gospel later in this chapter in verse 15. He says, it is a trustworthy statement. In other words, this is something you can believe in. This is something you can base your life on. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. If He saved the chief of sinners, He can save you. Look to Him. Trust in Him. And may we who have trusted in Him not live below the level of our privileges. May God's grace work within us. Well, I've made quite a point of the grace of God. I think that's a good way for us to end with a hymn and no greater hymn on the grace of God than Newton's hymn, Amazing Grace. So let's stand and sing number 227 in the red book, Amazing Grace. That's true, Father. We will sing Your praises throughout eternity. There will be no end to that. And we will not want for there to be an end to it. We will not be able to contain the praise we have. And it will only increase as Your glory increases to us for all eternity, world without end. Why? Because of your grace that sent your Son to die for us and the grace that brought us to a saving knowledge of Him. Thank you for that, Father. May we live lives for you and defend your truth, defend the gospel. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.